those who haven't been to the Lavra before, uh, we are trying to live in a different way, an experimental way. And we've been around for about four years. We are dedicated to uh, three principles that humans exist to serve others, that uh, life is a process of creative, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual growth, and that we have a responsibility to live sustainably and reflectively. Uh, and so we try to embody that in the way we live, and that takes many different forms, but one of the areas that it takes is trying to provide an environment where people can talk about different ideas, and ideas that are relevant to uh, the lives that uh, pe our community is living in. And so we've had a series of lectures, this is now uh, the third one, I believe, uh, and perhaps one of the most special nights for us because of the speaker uh, who's coming and the role he's played in the intentional uh, community movement. Okay. So uh, tonight's speaker is Dr. Timothy Miller, and he is uh, one of the most prominent authorities on the history of intentional communities in the world. To speak with him is, is a great gift because he is encyclopedic in his knowledge of various ways of living throughout history because he literally did write the encyclopedia of intentional communities. <laughs> Uh, he has been uh, recognized by the American Communal Studies Association as a distinguished scholar. He is the past president of the International Communal Studies Association, which for those who like ac acronyms is ICSA. Um, and he has uh, been a professor of religious studies at University of Kansas since uh, before I was born. Uh, he, among his many uh, books, uh, his most recent, uh, recent books are uh, Spiritual and Visionary, Visionary Communities Out to Save the World, which is 2013, The Modern Utopia, Alternative Communities Then and Now, 1960s Communes, Hippies and Beyond, and a second edition of The Hippies and American Value. Uh, if you go through his CV, you find a lot of gems in there, including an article on uh, Californian communes uh, in a book called West of Eden. And during our election season, we might note a little-known publication that he wrote on how the ultra-conservative political movement began in community. So uh, we might show that to some of our ultra-conservative friends. Uh, the title of that book is, uh, is not uh, inappropriately, The cultic milieu. Uh, and despite of, or perhaps because of, all his work on hippies, he has remained a really groovy dude. So I really uh, appreciate him coming out from Kansas to offer these words. And uh, with that, uh, let us welcome uh, Dr. Timothy Miller. Well, thank you very much. I encourage you to lie and exaggerate. You did a great job of it. <laughs> so away we go. Having a great time out here. You guys have a great place to live, believe me. And this is terrific. Um, when Stephen first got in touch with me about coming out here to uh, speak on campus and then out here, he said out here he wanted me to address the question of what's the future of the intentional communities movement. Well. Uh, that's simple. It's going to go on. Uh, they've been around for thousands of years. They're not going away. History's a guide to that. The Buddhist Sangha has been in continuous existence for something like 2,500 years. Uh, uh, Benedictine monasticism has been going for 1,500 years. It's a very long established tradition and it, it will continue. So that's the answer. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? <laughs> uh, okay. Now, first of all, just a quick definition. What's an intentional community? I think that matters because uh, then you, we know what we're talking about. Uh, I, to my mind, and not everyone would define it the way I do, but to my mind, uh, there are four basic elements. One is uh, some kind of vision, some kind of common basis, a commitment that uh, draws you away from mainstream society. I think by definition you're separated somewhat, and it's on the basis of, a, of an idea. There's something you're committed to. It could be a religious idea. I think today for secular communities it's often environmentalism. But uh, anyway, an idea and that basis that is somewhat separatist in its nature. Uh, second, you need to live together. And that can be in 
here in scattered buildings, but they're all close at hand, or in some communities uh, in one building. In the Oneida community in New York State, mid-19th century, they believed that every person ought to have a room and every room ought to be under that same roof. So they had over 300 bedrooms for their members. That You can do it that way if you want to. Um, there, the third element is economic sharing. Uh, some people say to be a true commune, you have to absolutely pool everything, no private money, property. Uh, I don't go that far, but I say some economic sharing. And this would qualify here, the common ownership of property. That's a heavy economic sharing investment. So that's one element. And then finally, the last element, critical mass. This is much debated in communal studies. Uh, the most common number that's cited is five people not related by blood or marriage. That's a pretty small number, I think, but uh, that is the most common one, and I'm okay with living with that. Uh, just a quick note on communities of the past. Uh, they've been here for a long time in American history, and writing my encyclopedia, I've, I've got a copy in my car. I, sh I forgot to bring it over. I'll get it in a little while, and you can look at it. Um, but I've got about 3,100 that I've found in American history uh, in the main. These were enough that I could write an entry about them. And I have another 1,300 in an appendix where I think they existed, but I couldn't find much information on them. Uh, and then I've got another about the same number, about 1,300 that have been mentioned somewhere, but I don't even, I'm not even confident they existed. So add all of that up, we're talking four or 5,000 that we can identify, but that's far, far from the total. We don't know most of them for a variety of reasons. Some of them try to hide, um, and often because there's conflict with the authorities of one kind or another. Uh, sometimes they just don't want to attract visitors. But uh, I think there are many times more than we know about. So I think we're talking about tens of thousands of active communities in American history and thousands of them active today. I think that's a reasonable guess. Uh, the uh, when did they begin? I define this as something breaking out of mainstream society. So as far as I'm concerned, traditional American Indian tribes don't qualify for the simple reason that that was the society. They weren't breaking away from anything. That's, they were it. That was just what they were doing. So we're talking about breakaway groups in a sense. Um, I think the first one that really qualifies is Plymouth Colony, 1620. Plymouth Colony was not only people seeking to the religious freedom for themselves, but also, there's an economic basis to it. Their financial backers insisted that they hold all goods in common because they thought that was a cheaper way to live than private households, private money, and therefore it'd be more profit would be returned to these financial backers. But they lived for about the first two years in, in a matter of total communal economy. So to my mind, that's, that's a beginning point for it. Uh, but others, there was a community called Ephrata in the 18th century, started in the 1730s. Uh, that existed for the better part of a century in Pennsylvania. Effort is the oldest one of which we have any built remains in America. Their main buildings are still there, maintained by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, Shakers, of course, very important part of the story. I presume most of you have heard of the Shakers. They came in 1774 from England, and they are still with us. There are four Shakers alive today. Wow. They live in Maine, it's a Sabbath Day Lake community, and you want to go visit them? Be my guest, be their guest. They'd be glad to have you. Um, 19th century, there was a real heyday. The Harmony Society started, they were German immigrants, lived in Pennsylvania, then in Indiana, then back in Pennsylvania. About a thousand members. Um, they were so prosperous in their industries that at one point they guaranteed a loan for the U.S. government. Uh, they, were, they did well, of course, today. The U.S. government needs that kind of luck, help all the time, I think. Um, the Amana colonies, any of you seen the Amana colonies? If you drive through Iowa on Interstate 80, it's right there. And they, they uh, were communal, fully communal for about 90 years. And they're still there today. The church is still going. A lot of common property still there, really. Although not totally communal anymore. The Oneida community I mentioned in New York State, uh, the 300 people, each with a bedroom. They needed separate bedrooms for privacy because this was a 300-member group marriage. Um, and they had what they called uh, meetings or 
conversations or different words for what they did in the various bedrooms. Uh, they even had a form of birth control and uh, all kinds of things. Anyway, a very interesting group. It's one scholars love to study for some reason. Um, there, incidentally, some of the descendants uh, of the community still live in the 300 room house, the mansion house in upstate New York, and you can go rent a room there. They run part of it as a hotel. So, big wave later in the century, uh, Mormons turned to communitarianism in a major way in the 1870s, um, and a number of, of communal villages, some of them totally economically communal, some of them cooperative, less totally communal. Uh, for a few years, that was huge. Uh, what, why did they not continue? Basically because it was Brigham Young's pet project. When he died in 1877, the next leaders of the church, they were <laughs> mainly concerned for the next decade or so with avoiding the federal government because the government was really getting on their case about polygamy. So uh, uh, that kind of took a back seat at that point. Hutterites came in the 1870s, Anabaptists, their spiritual kin of Amish and Mennonites. They've lived totally communally in colonies. They have about 500 colonies today in the U.S. and Canada uh, with an average of around 100 members apiece. So about 50,000 Hutterites in North America, about a third of those in the United States. They're absolutely thriving today. Uh, the 1880s, there were Jewish colonies, dozens of Jewish colonies founded. And after 1880, the pogroms, there was this huge Jewish immigration. Most American Jews owe their, trace their ancestry to that migration. And there were many, many communities set up just to help them get on their feet and lasted various lengths of time from a year or two to a little longer, uh, somewhat longer in some cases. All sorts of things came along. Uh, the Koresh and Unity started in Chicago, moved to Florida and assembled a goodly group of people on the basis of a, an interesting theology that the earth is hollow and we live on the inside. Why do we not fly away into space? The earth is rotating and it is centrifugal force that presses us against the earth. That's gravity. Um, we live on the inside. Okay. They even made a test and proved that it's true. So, uh, bet you didn't know that. Uh, I could explain that to you sometime. Uh, early 20th century, Father Divine came along, a five foot tall black man who said he was God in the flesh um, and attracted something like 30,000 people to his communal establishments believing in him. Some of them still there, still going, but in small numbers today. Uh, the House of David, early 20th century, uh, totally communal movement with about a thousand members headquartered in Michigan. They uh, were vegetarians, uh, quite environmentalists in some ways, best remembered to those of a certain age for their 1920s, 1930s, 1940s baseball teams. They didn't cut their hair uh, which they said was a biblical commandment. And so they became known as the long-haired baseball players. But uh, there was a lot more than that to them. Anyway, I'm honoring them tonight. This is their official <laughs> baseball cap, <laughs> uh, which I got there. Uh, 1960s, of course, the largest wave of communal living. Uh, hippies, of course, thousands of communes there. We can't begin to track all of them. Uh, another source, I think, not appreciated that much, the Jesus movement. The Jesus freaks of the late 60s, early 70s formed probably thousands of communes um, in pursuing their religious vocation. So uh, a huge history all through American history. There's never been a time when we didn't have a lot of them. The present, uh, lots of them. If you look up the community's directory, uh, which you can get online at ic.org, intentionalcommunities.org. Um, look it up. There are thousands of communities there. And uh, to repeat myself, basically, there are thousands of, of times as many communities out there as are listed there. I know I could give you a list of cases of stable, long-lived communities doing quite well that absolutely don't want to be listed. And very few people know about them, but they're there, believe me. Um, I asked, there was a fellow that worked for the Fellowship for Intentional Community and he spent most of his life, really, his adult life on the road, just visiting one after another. I asked him once, how many are there beyond what you have listed? He said he had 10,000 on his list. The directory only lists something over 1,000. That's how many didn't want to be listed. And he guessed that for every one he had, there were probably five or 10 more uh, because he found them practically every day. So 
it's a huge thing today. So we have the surviving older communities, the Hutterites who are healthier than they've ever been in their 500 year history. Uh, we have surviving <coughs> communities from the 60s. I think the popular images, the ones from the 60s all crashed and burned, not true. There are hundreds of them still around, uh, typically not getting so much publicity, but plenty of them still there. Uh, lots and lots of spiritual communities. There was a time when most spiritual communities were Christian, um, but today lots of them are Buddhist, lots of them are Hindu, many different, well, all of the world religions are, are represented. We also have artist communities today, there are quite a few of those, and uh, very importantly, since the 1970s, we've seen a great uh, explosion of gay and lesbian communities, both, both varieties. Uh, more lesbian than gay men, I think, but uh, definitely quite a few of those. So, lots of communities. Uh, one thing that happens to me, I'd say maybe once a month or so, I get a phone call from a reporter say, I hear that communities are on the upswing, there's a real surge going on, is that true? And my answer to that is, I've heard that my whole adult life, and I don't know. Um, I, think, I think they're there. That's something that, when I get a little time, I have all this backlist of projects, right? I want to try to figure out an answer to that. Has there really been any kind of surge over time? I honestly don't know. My gut reaction is probably not any great surge. I think it's a small but steady part of our society. There are people interested in that and they're just there. So the future, that's my assigned topic. Um, I don't know, I think it's hard to predict. I'm not very good at all at predicting the future, except I will say I think they will be with us. Um, so, that's the answer to that, but I want to preface some further thoughts on that with, uh, with some thoughts about what is to me a great conundrum of communities in contemporary life today, and that is that I think we as a people, we Americans, we people of the world really want and need community. I think there's a great longing for it, very widespread in our culture, but we don't get it. We don't have much of it compared to the size of the culture. Uh, so why do I think there are more people, many more people, who want community in their lives than, than are doing it? Um, well, I would say, for openers, check out any issue of Communities Magazine. I don't know if that's circulated here. It's a small circulation magazine. It's in some health food stores. Um, the classified ad section in the back is called Reach. And it always has ads, every issue, from people looking for communities and from people wanting to found new communities. Uh, just rather randomly, one recent issue I just grabbed and looked at, uh, people were invited to help start an eco-village and retreat center in my home state of Kansas, they, uh, a desert community in Arizona, a co-housing community in California, an urban cooperative in Hawaii, and a large shared household in New Jersey. All over the country, different models, different kinds of things. Every issue you find that kind of range. And you can assume, again, that a lot of people had very similar ideas and didn't take out ads, maybe didn't know about that magazine for that matter. Um, another bit of evidence for community-mindedness is the Fellowship for Intentional Community website. Apart from all these listings they have, last time I asked the people who run it uh, how popular it was, they said the website was getting about 66,500 hits a month. Uh, that's about 2,200 a day uh, with 6.5 page views per visit and they said the numbers were increasing month to month. Uh, now of course not everyone in the site is in marketing in, in the market for community but uh, surely there's an interest there someone's interested somehow so there's there's interest out there even if you're not really looking to live in one maybe you're dreaming a little bit about it and thinking maybe this might have something to it but for all of that interest in communities the number of people who are doing it is really small <laughs> it's a small fraction of one percent of the population uh, trying to make a count is a daunting task um, so I've tried to do it um, I decided I would try to count up the population of the hundreds of American communities in the 2007 edition of the Communities Directory. Uh, there's a newer one out now, but uh, it wasn't available when I did this rather lengthy exercise. Uh, but I don't think the results would be much different today. In very round numbers, the listing suggested that there were something like 10,000 adults living in communities of five or more members each in the United States. 
But there are so many problems uh, with those numbers that even getting within a couple of orders of magnitude of it is dubious. One problem is that the numbers are self-reported. And self-reported figures, I know from working on statistics about American religious membership and participation, are wildly unreliable. Uh, if they were reliable, you'd all be going to church every Sunday. Uh, they're not reliable. Uh, beyond that, the most important skewing factor is that of all the huge numbers of communities, huge numbers choose not to be listed in the directory, so you can't get a handle on that. So I took another path toward trying to find an estimate. The Catholic religious communities, the monasteries, convents, keep pretty careful track of their members. And in the most recent report I could find last year, they reported 11,710 priests, 48,546 sisters, and 4,200 brothers for a total communal population. This isn't parish priests, this is people living in monasteries and convents. Total population of 64,456. Uh, there are two other, <clears throat> two other groups of communities with five-figure populations. The Mormon fundamentalists, who are thought to have maybe 30,000 people living communally in the United States, and the Hutterites again, who uh, around 15 or 20,000 in the U.S. And, and twice that many in Canada. So you add those together, including the Catholics, and you're talking about maybe 110,000 communitarians. Okay, now, the wildest guess of all I'm going to conjecture that there are 5,000 other intentional communities averaging 10 members apiece. That's another 50,000. So add that to the 10, 110,000 we've already got. And just to be cautious, let's uh, put that in the middle and report it as a range. So the range is 135,000 to 185,000. Uh, the point of all this guesswork is to say, compared to the American population, that's not very many. Uh, the American population right now is about 318, 19 million. And so 135,000, the low figure, is around 1 in 2,400 people living communally. That's less than 1 20th of 1% of the population. Uh, the larger end, 185,000, it's fewer than 1 in 1,500. That's about 1 17th of 1% of the American population. And if you take out the Catholic communities, which are linked to a larger tradition that I think provides a very important support system to them, and focus only on the independent freestanding communities, the numbers are even more drastic. It's pretty clear to me, I, th I think it's a good guess, we have fewer than 100,000 such communitarians, which comes down to fewer than 1 in 3,000 Americans, less than 1 30th of 1% of the population. Take out the Hutterites and the fundamentalist Mormons, the two really big groups, um, and you can cut those numbers in half. Uh, no matter how you slice it, communal living is not a mass movement. So why not? I've just said that people long for community in their lives, so why aren't they doing it? Well, several answers to that, I think. Uh, one is that community in the broad sense doesn't necessarily involve a residential situation that meets even a basic definition of intentional community. I think the communitarian desires of many people can be met, can be met non-residentially through churches and social organizations, political organizations, uh, the Stop Trump movement right now maybe, uh, <laughs> fraternal organizations, many other such institutions. But still, there's a gap. Why do so, people, so few people live in community? Well, many who have tried to consider this disconnect between a widespread desire for a community and the difficulty of starting actual communities and getting them to function well have focused on what I think I like to call internal issues, things such as interpersonal relations, decision-making processes, leadership, financial strength, uh, many accounts of communal life, if you go read the literature, especially of short-lived communities, talk about internal bickering, conflicts between the leaders and the rank and file, inadequate work skills on the parts of members, especially when, it, especially when a community is trying to make a living through agriculture. That's hard to do if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, take ju about just any issue of Communities Magazine once again over the last several years, and you'll find those things, especially personal relations, group process, discussed at great length. People say this is what we need to work on. But I think for all of that, that issues that I would call external can be more important than the internal ones. American society, I think, has structures and attitudes that actively discourage community. 
Uh, one rather fundamental problem is what I will call, for lack of a better term, basic American selfishness. <laughs> Our whole national ethos is predicated on a me-first approach to life, something that's about as contrary to communitarianism as anything could be. Little acts of me-first rudeness are all around us. I could talk about the people that intrude in my own life that way, my neighbors who needlessly park half blocking our common access, make it hard for the rest of us to get through. Other neighbors whose free range cats kill all the songbirds that we work hard to attract at my house. Um, another neighbor whose little yappy dog is left out to bark all night, and on and on. You all know these things, right? Uh, I think the reach pages of Communities Magazine bring these all-American tendencies into focus quite clearly. In every issue, several communities advertise that they're looking for new members, but just as many ads ask for new members to join a uh, community prospective founder's idea, a new venture that's someone's vision that's out there. One way to interpret this, it seems to me, is to say that people don't want to work within someone else's vision often, and that's good old American me-firstness. Uh, I want people to help me work out my plan. This is not a very communitarian approach. Uh, I think that kind of approach really negates any possibility of community uh, because to make a community work, one of the essential things you've got to do is, is work on reducing the will, uh, reducing the ego, uh, and unless you do that, you're not going to get it to work. You've got to give up your me-firstness or it ain't going to work. Um, I don't think it's an accident that one vow that, that religious community members, Catholic and Orthodox at least, one vow they take is obedience. You give up your choices and you obey someone else's way of doing things. American individualism is very deeply ingrained in us and I think that's a fundamental reason why most people don't join communities, even though they'd like to in many cases. Another problem, one that could be solved easily legislatively but may never be, is zoning. Crystal and I were just talking about that a minute ago. <laughs> zoning laws have existed in this country for less than a century. So when the Shakers and the Harmonists and the Amana colonists and so many others set up shop, zoning was a problem they didn't have to worry about. When they bought land, they could use it as they like, and if they wanted to build a building that didn't have so many, a stud every 16 inches, an electrical outlet every eight feet, that's our code where I live, and things like that, they just did what they wanted to do. You want to build a straw bale house? You want to have a green roof on your house? No problem. You just did it, and it was your problem. When they bought land, which they often bought in large tracts because it was cheap in those days, uh, they could use it as they liked. If they mixed commercial with residential and industrial uses in some unconventional way, no problem. But since the early 20th century, zoning has been, has been implemented in most of the country. And I understand the basic motivation there. Uh, I don't want my next door neighbor to sell out and put in a Burger King with a 24-hour drive through <laughs> under my bedroom window, okay? I understand zoning. but. The problem is that, I think inadvertently really, zoning laws have really impeded intentional communities. In many parts of my city, if more than three people occupy a house, they must all be related. That means that my lesbian next door neighbors, a couple with children, who until recently, I mean the marriage thing is recent, right? Until very recently, they were forbidden by law to marry and who were the absolute best neighbors you could ever hope to have. Uh, they could have been run out of their home if some moral crusader decided to go after them. Zoning didn't allow it. Too many unrelated people. And if such innocuous, indeed attractive people are, are threatened by zoning laws, how much more are communitarians unable to pursue their dreams? Uh, I know of a large intentional community in California, I'll say that much, no more, <laughs> has around 60 resident members and tries to keep an utterly low profile. They probably wouldn't even like for me to say that much <laughs> because they want to avoid attracting attention to themselves. It's located in a county where, bulldoze, where officials have bulldozed two intentional communities that they found illegal, and the remaining community, I think, has some reasonable fear it could happen again. And they put a lot of effort into building their place. Another broad category of modern anti-communitarian forces at work in our society, I think, consists of technological devices, including many that most of us use. I think the biggest offender here is the automobile. 
uh, which despite its enormous convenience, I have one, of course, most of you do, uh, seems to bring out the worst in a lot of people who use it. I've, I've been kind of struck by the fact that where I live, most people are fairly courteous face to face. We open doors for each other routinely. We say please and thank you. We smile at people and say hello on the street and things like that. That's pretty typical. We wait in line instead of cutting in. Um, and yet, an awful lot of, a surprising number of people act really rudely and aggressively behind the wheel. At least that's my perception. They run red lights and cut people off and speed all the time. Uh, I think the automobile is an inherently isolating device and it, it, it gives you anonymity. And I've wondered if maybe if we could say paint people the owner's name in large letters on each car, <laughs> if maybe they'd pay a little more attention to what kind of image they were conveying. The phone number on the license plate. <laughs> that <laughs> would help. Speed up, <laughs> <slow down. laughs> that would help. Uh, uh, so, um, if the automobile's anti-communal, what about television? Uh, as, as television technology has progressed, it draws ever more people away from social interaction. Uh, entertainment used to be largely communal. People would mingle with each other at dances, at concerts, at movies, other events held in public spaces. And television, now of course the average American watches television several hours a day, and it simply draws people away from these kind of common activities that bring us all together and reinforces the value of being alone. Even worse than that, in my humble opinion, uh, not very humble really, is the near universal spread of the cell phone. People used to walk down the street looking at people around them, and what do they do today? Um, they look at the, well, they used to look at the surrounding environment and greet people and stuff. Now they walk around either with a phone firmly held to the side of the head or more frequently walking around going like this, right? So um, not looking at other people, not interacting with people around them. Uh, and how, how essential is this? What are we gaining from it? I live on a campus, right? I work on a campus, and I can tell you that of the audio, the, the spoken part of the conversation that you can hear, the typical conversation is like this. Oh, not much. Uh, what are you doing? Um, maybe I'll go find something to eat. Want to talk? Why don't you give me a call later? Uh, I mean, this is, this is essential communication. Uh, <laughs> I require my students not to use cell phones in class, but then I go to a faculty meeting and they're all checking their email and their Facebook and what have you. Um, many of us worry, I worry about the use of cell phones by drivers. Research has shown that using a cell phone creates a distraction that's on average the equivalent of the distraction of a blood alcohol level of 0.12%, which is one and a half times the legal limit in most states. Um, and that incidentally is just using a cell phone hands-free doesn't make much difference because it's not your hand That's the issue it's your attention that is taken away by the phone So you're more than drunk using a phone driving and much more than that if you're texting of course Which I think is illegal in most states now, but as we know very widely done But I digress uh, Get a little diatribe there um, Bad driving is hardly the only product of cell phone use. I think decline of human community is just as serious. Uh, and it happens in a lot of ways. I think one sad byproduct of the spread of cell phones is that we're seeing the extinction of phone books where we used to be able to locate each other, each other easily. Hard to do today. Another anti-communal effect, you might say. Computers. Computers have brought a lot of convenience into our lives. Uh, They've been terrific for communities, linking them to each other, but they can be seriously anti-communal. Uh, I think the biggest culprit there is social networking, which though it does promote interaction for sure, it puts people in front of monitors or on their phones rather than in personal contact, and I think that is kind of anti-human, anti-communal. I mean, you go on and on, air conditioning, right? People used to sit on their front porches when it was hot. Now everyone's inside air conditioning. You're not going to interact with your neighbors much that way. And uh, that's not even looking at the environmental impacts of it. Uh, alternatives to those things exist, but these are the choices that we've made. Uh, but enough of that. I don't want to say that technology is the sole culprit in the decline of American communal values or the sole impediment to the growth of communities. 
I think there is one other social presence that might be even worse than isolating technology, and that is the suspicion of cooperation that is really both wide and deep in America. That suspicion seems to be, to me, a product of modern history. Uh, Charles Nordoff, in 1875, wrote a book called The Communistic Societies of the United States, one of the classics of the field, great, great piece of work. And he, there was no controversy over it at the time. Others in the communities movement of the late 19th century used that word, communist, in a, in a positive, uncontroversial way. But what happened in the 20th century? Marxism. And until the fall of the Soviet Union and its related states about 25 years ago, there was no more horrifying word in the English language than communism. And although today its definitive horrifics have been replaced by terms such as terrorism and al-Qaeda and so forth, its demonizing power uh, has remained strong. Socialism may be slightly milder, but it too remains a term of enormous appro opprobrium as we've seen when universal health care is labeled socialist and therefore condemned. Um, my best hope for this political year, no matter how this comes out, is I think Bernie Sanders is making some progress toward rehabilitating that word, which I think is wonderful. But the effect of the anti-communist, anti-socialist fervor of, on intentional communities is not just hypothetical. In the 1930s, communitarians, of whom there were quite a few, were acutely aware of the persecution they faced when their way of life became known and they tended to keep their profiles low. In the 1940s, the New Deal uh, founded over a hundred communities under the Resettlement Administration and other agencies that helped thousands of families escape abject poverty through cooperative rural projects, little communities, government sponsored. And uh, in the 1940s, these communities were summarily shut down by an act of Congress simply because they were collective. They had people cooperating together. Com the Congress couldn't stand that. A few years later, a few years earlier, excuse me, uh, the public officials in the state of Arkansas closed uh, a communal college called Commonwealth College. Why? Because it was a nest of radicals. And the name Commonwealth didn't help. Common, oh no, it's kind of like communist. Um, the college was put out of business by state action in Arkansas. So all I'm saying is there, there's, an, a, I think, a very powerful anti-communitarian bias in American life. Uh, I think that intentional communities, uh, the modern forms that are most popular today are eco-villages and co-housing. I think they have a great deal to offer a world that has tremendous social and environmental problems, but the forces running in the other direction are formidable. And somehow those forces have to be identified and dealt with if communities are going to prosper. And boy, believe me, that's a big project. Okay, so doom and gloom, that's it. <laughs> but I don't think it's the whole story, okay? Be happy for a moment. Um, millions of people do want more community in their lives. And although many of them, I say, do get it through religious institutions and social activities and so forth, I think a com committed minority still solidly uh, pursue communal living. Um, so what makes it happen when it does happen? Well, there's several answers once again. One is that I think sometimes it's a response to outside forces. Uh, World War II, for example, spawned a number of communities inadvertently. Conscientious objectors in World War II, those who refused to go, were really vilified in American society. It was a really hard time to be an objector. And in the face of that, uh, quite a few of them founded communities just for mutual support to help survive in these very hard times. In the Depression, Many, many hundreds of communities are started during the Depression. People banding together have a better chance of making it. And they did, uh, quite effectively, with and without the government. Uh, so we don't know what will come along, right, like that, an outside force that might push people toward community. Another thing is that we don't know what kind of inspired leadership can come along. Um, who could have predicted the arrival of Anne Lee in 1774, who founded the Shakers, uh, easily the longest-lived community in American history, uh, closing in now closely on 250 years? Um, who, would, who would have expected something like that to happen? A poor, uneducated English young woman uh, leading a massive, major communal movement. 
Uh, more recently, who would have imagined Stephen Gaskin, this hippie philosopher in San Francisco, attracting thousands of people to a piece of land in Tennessee and forming a community there based on hippie values. And that is still going today. Want to see it in work? To, it's still going. 150, 200 people still live at the farm. Um, what about other spiritual teachers? What about secular visionaries? I mean, we don't know is all I'm saying, but that kind of thing has spurred community in the past and I think very well could pop up again. One, one thing to always remember, the community's movement, if we, we call it a movement, but it's really a movement without a clear center. It's many different things that are hard to predict. Um, one thing is also the case is I think the evolution of communal forms will be attractive and has the potential to attract more participants. Communities today tend to be smaller than they once were. Uh, groups like the Harmony Society, uh, the Amana Colonies could attract a thousand members, uh, even though they were totally communal uh, and very tightly regulated, disciplined lives. Uh, today, communities tend to allow for more individual choices than those strict ones did of old. And today, they're less likely to demand 100% financial commitment to the community, and, and certainly not the 100% behavioral commitment that was expected. Uh, so I think this a new, more liberal approach actually has an appeal. You can go into a community and still keep some of your individuality. Got to trade out some of it, but maybe not all of it, as you once did. Um, I don't know, a lot of other possibilities. I think some of the 60s communes may point toward the future and point toward forming of new ones. Stephen Gaskin, who just died a couple of years ago at, from the farm, uh, leader and spiritual teacher there, uh, several years ago purchased uh, another tract of land, a little over 100 acres adjacent to the farm, and started Rosinante, named after Don Quixote's horse. Uh, which was specifically a hippie, old, he loved the word hippie, a hippie old age retirement center. Um, it, would be, it would have in the middle of a circle of houses, a community center, and a medical clinic. Every house would be accessible. Everything would have ramps and so forth. Um, some of Rosinante had been built by the time of Stephen, Stephen's death. And I don't know its current status. I don't know if it's going to go or not, but I do think... Uh, communities of seniors has a real future. Uh, something that uh, gives you some freedom, but also some support. How bad is that? And I think one of the tragedies, again, my personal opinion, which is very valuable, as you know, um, a very unfortunate thing about senior citizen housing, it's typically commercial, owned by a profit-making institution. Why in the world don't we own it if we're paying for it? I don't get it, but that's the way it is today. Um, but there are senior-oriented communities that are cooperative, and I, I think we're going to see a lot more of them. In fact, I think there's a great opportunity waiting for people to go out and organize. Um, have any of you uh, ever run into the Burbank Senior Artist Colony down in Burbank? Um, it's cooperative, and it's specifically artists, so they have art studios and performance spaces and things like that. <clears throat> and it's senior and it's cooperative. Why can't there be a thousand things like that, one in every city? Um, the ones I've heard of typically follow a co-housing model. <clears throat> you have some ownership in it, but also some common facilities. Well, joint ownership in that. Um, and very much they encourage members to engage in mutual assistance. Some members can drive and some can't, right? So the ones that drive help the other people get where they need to be. Very simple, neighborly things like that. Um, when I did uh, several years ago I had a fairly extensive set of interviews with people who'd lived in communes of the 60s. I learned that quite a few of them, quite without me prompting them, raised the possibility of going back to that form in retirement. They saw it as something that worked very well with aging. Uh, finally, I do believe, those of you who were there yesterday heard me say this, I do believe we're, we're in an age where resources are going to dwindle, they're going to get more and more drastically scarce. And I, my hope is that the crisis that I think is confronting us will make people band together for the common good. Doing it together is, is much more productive than fighting each other over resources. That said, I'm not optimistic that's going to happen. Uh, when we have almost as many guns as people in this country, uh, how do you hope for a peaceful solution? I'm not so sure. Turn off your 
your TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's the that's the main part of what I have to say today. So, oh, but guess what? I have five minutes left, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I would just like to quickly. Uh, engage a few ideas that I think are misperceptions about communities that I think may help make it hard to, to live communally and start communities. Um, one myth is that that outsiders uh, often perpetuate is that members of, com of communities are deeply committed and are likely to stay involved for life and very obedient and all of that. Uh, that may have been more true 150 years ago. I don't think it's very true today. Uh, I think communities today have a lot of turnover typically and they survive, the ones that are well organized survive despite that turnover. Uh, Kat Kincaid, one of the founders of Twin Oaks in Virginia, one of the longest, live almost 50 years old now in Virginia, uh, with 100 members, they're thriving today. Uh, she said that they started out with the idea of deep abiding commitment and eventually, guess what? They now have an organized plan to handle turnover because that's just the way it is. And she said, that's just something you get used to because that's reality. Um, Communities, I think, resemble today more than Catholic monasticism, say, where you take a lifetime vow, supposedly. I think it's more like the Buddhist model, especially uh, Vipassana Buddhism, where uh, you join a monastery for a while and you become a monk, take the vows and do the, live the life. And that's, uh, you know, do as long as you want to, and then you quit and go have a family, whatever. That's, that's very common in the Buddhist world, and I think that's something that is well we do see here and I think will more uh, so that's one thing I think uh, misconception that needs to be addressed another thing I'd like to see vanish from discussion of community is the word failure over and over I hear people say well this community failed meaning it closed uh, we owe part of that to uh, a scholar then a management consultant today named Rosabeth Moss Cantor who wrote a widely read 1972 book called uh, Commitment and Community. Uh, she surveyed 30 19th century communities, divided them into two categories, successful and unsuccessful, failure that is. Um, what was her test of success? One test, longevity. If you survived 25 years or more, you were successful. If you didn't, you were a failure. Well, um, a lot of communities don't survive for 25 years, so are they really failures? Is that the right word? Um, I just can't believe it's an accurate description. I think success and failure should be studied in terms of the impact that they have on people's lives and on the society, the larger society. In all of my interviews, I very rarely found anyone who called his or her communal experience a failure. Uh, almost invariably, they thought saw it as a great part of their lives. They loved it. They had fond memories of it. Uh, but eventually it became time to move on. Uh, hardly any had any regrets about having done it, though one of the questions we asked was, would you do it again? They weren't quite as unanimous on that. <laughs> um, so, communities do close, but why? Okay, I'm a teacher by profession, right? So I have a handout here. Um, so, yeah, now these are two different handouts. So I think they're about enough to go around. Um, as I said before, one of the widespread perceptions is that communities fall apart because of internal friction, disputes among members. And I think that is a partial explanation because uh, communities do tend to draw people with strong personalities, uh, not the subservient types that really would make it work better. Uh, but it's far from a complete explanation. So over a century, a political a century ago, a p political science named Frederick Bouchy, he's one of the sheets there, both sides of it, um, he uh, tried to take a look at that. He found 56 communities about which he had enough information to conclude in this study. And only 12 of them had this kind of disagreement, internal disagreement as the cause of dissolution. And you see, I've tried to summarize on one side of that sheet the, um, uh, the uh, I've kind of reduced his categories a little bit and tried to see what it was. But only 12 of 56 for in, due to internal disagreements. What else was it? Inadequate financing, very big problem in many cases. Death of the leader, in some cases just merger with another community. 
and so communal life goes on. Um, one of his categories was lack of superior beings. It's interesting. Uh, I would note in my own studies, focused on more recent times, uh, two major causes of closing have been lack of farming skills, whose back to the land idealism, where back to the land idealism was the key to the communal vision and zoning problems, as I've said. Um, but I think Bushy's, find, Bushy's finding of lack of superior beings reminds me of something Horace Greeley said about communities and their problems in the 19th century. He wrote this in the New York Tribune, his newspaper. Uh, a serious obstacle to the success of any socialistic experiment must always be confronted. I allude to the kinds of persons who are naturally attracted to it. Along with many noble and lofty souls whose impulses are purely philanthropic and who are willing to labor and suffer reproach for any cause that promises to benefit mankind, there throng scores of whom the world is quite worthy. The conceited, the crotchety, the selfish, the headstrong, the pugnacious, the un unappreciated, the played out, the idle, and the good for nothing generally who, finding themselves utterly out of place and at a discount in the world as it is, rashly conclude that they are exactly fitted for the world as it ought to be. <laughs> These may have failed again and again and have been protested at every bank to which they've been presented, yet they are sure to jump into any new movement as if they had been expressly born to superintend and direct it, though they are morally certain to ruin whatever they lay their hands on. Destitute of means of practical ability, of prudence, tact, and common sense, they have such a wealth of assurance and self-confidence that they clutch the responsible positions which the capable and worthy modestly shrink from. So responsibilities that would tax the ablest are mistakenly devolved on the blindest and least fit. Many an experiment is thus wrecked. When engineered by its best members, it might have succeeded. Pretty harsh, right? But I think there's, there's some truth in that. That's for uh, nonprofits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> Many years later, uh, Gordon Yaswin, writing about his experience of a 60s commune, said something that I think kind of is kind of similar. Uh, their their pl place fell apart in less than a year. It is said that happy people do not volunteer to go to war. Neither, I say, do they join communities. The roots of this unhappiness may lie in either themselves or their world. We at Sun Hill Community did not know how to determine one from the other, so we hardly tried. We accepted virtually all who came, but I think that we at Sun Hill tended to assume that each other's various inadequacies to live in the mass society were due to the faults of that society and not to those of the individuals in question. Of course, we assumed that such inadequacies or hang-ups would straighten themselves out within the healthy context of our utopia. This was naive. <laughs> And finally, um, just a word about communities and so-called cults. A fair number of people today believe that our society is swarming with dangerous cults, uh, put in quotes, okay, groups that are terribly destructive to their members and a real danger to society at large. For better or worse, intentional communities are very often drawn into this controversy. They do have features that many consider cultic. But the problem with that analysis, I think, is that so does just about every religious body and social group that there is. What are the characteristics of a cult that you read about? They often have strong leaders. They work hard to attract new members. They try to get members to follow certain lifestyle rules. They try to get members to stay committed to the group's principles and put a lot of time into the group. And they want your money. Um, you know any religion that doesn't have all of those things? They all do. They have to, to make it work. So I think we'd just be better off getting rid of that term entirely and evaluating all groups on their merits and taking a look at them rather than just categorizing them. As far as I'm concerned, different is not pathological. I don't think communal living has anything fundamentally wrong with it. I think it's good. It's a positive thing for society. Uh, and I just like to, to see things analyze seriously. Not to say there aren't bad groups and bad people out there, there sure are. But don't just create a category and condemn everyone. It can hurt a lot of innocent people when you do. I think double standards are unfair. Small offbeat groups should have the same rights and privileges as anyone else. If they're breaking the law, arrest them. Otherwise, why don't they have the same freedom everyone else has? Or change the law. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When that happens. So anyway, uh, I end as I begin, 
world's head communities for thousands of years. I don't think they're going to go away. I think changes have survived, changes have come into the form. And I do think that intentional communities today have a lot to teach our larger society. In our world of individualism today, uh, uh, communities can show us a more humane way to live. I think they're utopian in the best sense of the word. They're microcosms of the good society. I really do believe they have a lot to teach us, and I hope we can learn from them. Uh, two of the most astute observers of intentional communities in the 19th century, William, William Hines, who wrote a major book still much read today uh, called The uh, Communities of the United States, um, and Charles Nordoff, I've referred to earlier, both had glowing things to say about the groups they studied. And I have, on the other hand, out taken uh, some copies of their analyses, both of them printed in, in Heinz's book. Uh, and my hope is that, I mean, you see, this is very positive stuff, and I just hope today's communities do as well, merit that evaluation too. And uh, I love the Lavra. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, all. movement of the late 19th century used that word communist in a in a positive uncontroversial way but what happened in the 20th century Marxism and until the fall of the Soviet Union and its related states about 25 years ago there was no more horrifying word in the English language than communism and although today its definitive horrifics have been replaced by terms such as terrorism and al-Qaeda and so forth its demonizing power uh, has remained strong. Socialism, maybe slightly milder, but it too remains a term of enormous appro opprobrium, as we've seen when universal health care is labeled socialist and therefore condemned. Um, my best hope for this political year, no matter how this comes out, is I think Bernie Sanders is making some progress toward rehabilitating that word, which I think is wonderful. But the effect of the anti-communist, anti-socialist fervor of, on intentional communities is not just hypothetical. In the 1930s, communitarians, of whom there were quite a few, were acutely aware of the persecution they faced when their way of life became known, and they tended to keep their profiles low. In the 1940s, the New Deal uh, founded over 100 communities under the Resettlement Administration and other agencies that helped thousands of families escape abject poverty through cooperative rural projects, little communities, government-sponsored. And uh, in the 1940s, these communities were summarily shut down by an act of Congress simply because they were collective. They had people cooperating together. Com the Congress couldn't stand that. A few years later, a few years earlier, excuse me, uh, the public officials in the state of Arkansas closed uh, a communal college called Commonwealth College. Why? Because it was a nest of radicals and the name Commonwealth didn't help. Common, oh no, it's kind of like communist. Um, the college was put out of business by state action in Arkansas. So all I'm saying is there, there's, an, a, I think, a very powerful anti-communitarian bias in American life. Uh, I think that intentional communities, uh, the modern forms that are most popular today are eco-villages and co-housing. I think they have a great deal to offer a world that has tremendous social and environmental problems, but the forces running in the other direction are formidable. And somehow those forces have to be identified and dealt with if communities are going to prosper. <laughs> Boy, believe me, that's a big project. Okay, so doom and gloom, that's it. <laughs> But I don't think it's the whole story, okay? Be happy for a moment. Um, millions of people do want more community in their lives. And although many of them, I say, do get it through religious institutions and social activities and so forth, I think a com committed minority still solidly uh, pursue communal living. Um, so what makes it happen when it does happen? Well, there's several answers once again. One is that I think sometimes it's a response to outside forces. Uh, World War II, for example, spawned a number of communities inadvertently. Conscientious objectors in World War II, those who refused to go, were really vilified in American society. It was a really hard time to be an objector. And 
in the face of that, uh, quite a few of them founded communities just for mutual support to help survive in these very hard times. In the Depression, many, many hundreds of communities are started during the Depression. People banding together have a better chance of making it. And they did, uh, quite effectively, with and without the government. Uh, so we don't know what will come along, right, like that, an outside force that might push people toward community. Another thing is that we don't know what kind of inspired leadership can come along. Um, who could have predicted the arrival of Anne Lee in 1774, who founded the Shakers, uh, easily the longest-lived community in American history, uh, closing in now closely on 250 years? Um, who, would, who would have expected something like that to happen? A poor, uneducated English young woman uh, leading a massive, major communal movement. Uh, more recently, who would have imagined Stephen Gaskin, this hippie philosopher in San Francisco, attracting thousands of people to a piece of land in Tennessee and forming a community there based on hippie values. And that is still going today. Want to see it in work? It's still going. 150, 200 people still live at the farm. Um, what about other spiritual teachers? What about secular visionaries? I mean, we don't know is all I'm saying, but that kind of thing has spurred community in the past and I think very well could pop up again. One, one thing to always remember, the community's movement, if we, we call it a movement, but it's really a movement without a clear center. It's many different things that are hard to predict. Um, one thing is also the case is I think the evolution of communal forms will be attractive and has the potential to attract more participants. Communities today tend to be smaller than they once were. Uh, Groups like the Harmony Society, uh, the Amana Colonies could attract a thousand members, uh, even though they were totally communal uh, and very tightly regulated, disciplined lives. Uh, today, communities tend to allow for more individual choices than those strict ones did of old. And today, they're less likely to demand 100% financial commitment to the community and, and certainly not the 100% behavioral commitment that was expected. Uh, so I think this a new, more liberal approach actually has an appeal. You can go into a community and still keep some of your individuality. Got to trade out some of it, but maybe not all of it as you once did. Um, I don't know. A lot of other possibilities. I think some of the 60s communes may point toward the future and point toward forming of new ones. Stephen Gaskin, who just died a couple of years ago at, from the farm, uh, leader and spiritual teacher there, uh, several years ago purchased uh, another tract of land a little over a hundred acres adjacent to the farm and started Rosinante, named after Don Quixote's horse, uh, which was specifically a hippie, old, he loved the word hippie, a hippie old age retirement center. Um, it, would be, it would have in the middle of a circle of houses, a community center, and a medical clinic. Every house would be accessible, everything would have ramps and so forth. Um, some of Rosinante had been built by the time of Stephen, Stephen's death, and I don't know its current status. I don't know if it's going to go or not, but I do think uh, communities of seniors has a real future, uh, something that uh, gives you some freedom but also some support. How bad is that? And I think one of the tragedies, again, my personal opinion, which is very valuable, as you know, um, <laughs> A very unfortunate thing about senior citizen housing, it's typically commercial, owned by a profit-making institution. Why in the world don't we own it if we're paying for it? I don't get it, but that's the way it is today. Um, but there are senior-oriented communities that are cooperative, and I, I think we're going to see a lot more of them. In fact, I think there's a great opportunity waiting for people to go out and organize. Um, have any of you uh, ever run into the Burbank Senior Artist Colony? down in Burbank. Um, it's cooperative and it's specifically artists, so they have art studios and performance spaces and things like that. <clears throat> and it's senior and it's cooperative. Why can't there be a thousand things like that, one in every city? Um, the ones I've heard of typically follow a co-housing model. <clears throat> you have some ownership in it, but also some common facilities, well, joint ownership in that. Um, and very much they encourage members to engage in mutual assistance. Some members can drive and some can't, right? So the ones that drive help the other people get where they need to be. Very simple neighborly things like that. Um, when I did uh, 
several years ago I had a fairly extensive set of interviews with people who'd lived in communes of the 60s. I learned that quite a few of them, quite without me prompting them, raised the possibility of going back to that form in retirement. They saw it as something that worked very well with aging. Uh, finally, I do believe, those of you who were there yesterday heard me say this, I do believe we're, we're in an age where resources are going to dwindle, they're going to get more and more drastically scarce, and I, my hope is that the crisis that I think is confronting us will make people band together for the common good. Doing it together is, is much more productive than fighting each other over resources. That said, I'm not optimistic that's going to happen. Uh, when we have almost as many guns as people in this country, uh, how do you hope for a peaceful solution? I'm not so sure. Turn off your TV. <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's the, that's the main part of what I have to say today. So, oh, but guess what? I have five minutes left, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I would just like to quickly uh, engage a few ideas that I think are misperceptions about communities that I think may help make it hard to, to live communally and start communities. Um, one myth is that that outsiders uh, often perpetuate is that members of, com of communities are deeply committed and are likely to stay involved for life and very obedient and all of that. Uh, that may have been more true 150 years ago. I don't think it's very true today. Uh, I think communities today have a lot of turnover typically and they survive. The ones that are well organized survive despite that turnover. Uh, Kat Kincaid, one of the founders of Twin Oaks in Virginia, one of the longest lived, almost 50 years old now in Virginia, uh, with 100 members, they're thriving today. Uh, she said that they started out with the idea of deep abiding commitment, and eventually, guess what? They now have an organized plan to handle turnover, because that's just the way it is. And she said, that's just something you get used to, because that's reality. Um, communities, I think, resemble today more than Catholic monasticism, say, where you take a lifetime vow, supposedly. I think it's more like the Buddhist model, especially uh, Vipassana Buddhism, where uh, you join a monastery for a while and you become a monk, take the vows and do the live the life, and that's, uh, you know, do as long as you want to, and then you quit and go have a family, whatever. That's, that's very common in the Buddhist world, and I think that's something that is, well, we do see here, and I think will more. Uh, so that's one thing, I think, a uh, misconception that needs to be addressed. Another thing I'd like to see vanish from discussion of community is the word failure. Over and over I hear people say, well, this community failed, meaning it closed. Uh, we owe part of that to uh, a scholar then, a management consultant today named Rosabeth Moss Cantor, who wrote a widely read 1972 book called uh, Commitment and Community. Uh, she surveyed 30 19th century communities, divided them into two categories, successful and unsuccessful, failure that is. Um, what was her test of success? One test, longevity. If you survived 25 years or more, you were successful. If you didn't, you were a failure. Well, um, a lot of communities don't survive for 25 years, so are they really failures? Is that the right word? Um, I just can't believe it's an accurate description. I think success and failure should be studied in terms of the impact that they have on people's lives and on the society, the larger society. In all of my interviews, I very rarely found anyone who called his or her communal experience a failure. Uh, almost invariably, they thought, saw it as a great part of their lives. They loved it. They had fond memories of it. Uh, but eventually, it became time to move on. Uh, hardly any had any regrets about having done it, though one of the questions we asked was, would you do it again? They weren't quite as unanimous on that. <laughs> um, so, communities do close, but why? Okay, I'm a teacher by profession, right, so I have a handout here. Um, so, yeah, now these are two different handouts, so I think they're about enough to go around. <coughs> Um, as I said before, one of the widespread perceptions is that communities fall apart because of internal friction, disputes among members. And I think that is a partial explanation because uh, communities do tend to draw people with strong personalities. 
and not the subservient types that really would make it work better. Uh, but it's far from a complete explanation. So over a century, a political a century ago, a political science named Frederick Bouchy, he's one of the sheets there, both sides of it, um, he uh, tried to take a look at that. He found 56 communities about which he had enough information to conclude in this study. And only 12 of them had this kind of disagreement, internal disagreement as the cause of dissolution. And you see, I've tried to summarize on one side of that sheet the, um, uh, the uh, I've kind of reduced his categories a little bit and tried to see what it was. But only 12 of 56 for in, due to internal disagreements. What else was it? Inadequate financing, very big problem in many cases. Death of the leader, in some cases just merger with another community and so communal life goes on. Um, one of his categories was lack of superior beings. It's interesting. Uh, I would note in my own studies, focused on more recent times, uh, two major causes of closing have been lack of farming skills, whose back to the land idealism, where back to the land idealism was the key to the communal vision and zoning problems, as I've said. Um, but I think Bushy's, find, Bushy's finding of lack of superior beings reminds me of something Horace Greeley said about communities and their problems in the 19th century. He wrote this in the New York Tribune, his newspaper. Uh, a serious obstacle to the success of any socialistic experiment must always be confronted. I allude to the kinds of persons who are naturally attracted to it. Along with many noble and lofty souls whose impulses are purely philanthropic, and who are willing to labor and suffer reproach for any cause that promises to benefit mankind, there throng scores of whom the world is quite worthy. The conceited, the crotchety, the selfish, the headstrong, the pugnacious, the un unappreciated, the played out, the idle, and the good for nothing generally, who finding themselves utterly out of place and at a discount in the world as it is, rashly conclude that they are exactly fitted for the world as it ought to be. <laughs> These may have failed again and again and have been protested at every bank to which they've been presented, yet they are sure to jump into any new movement as if they had been expressly born to superintend and direct it, though they are morally certain to ruin whatever they lay their hands on. Destitute of means of practical ability, of prudence, tact, and common sense, they have such a wealth of assurance and self-confidence that they clutch the responsible positions which the capable and worthy modestly shrink from. So responsibilities that would tax the ablest are mistakenly devolved on the blindest and least fit. Many an experiment is thus wrecked when engineered by its best members it might have succeeded. Pretty harsh, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I think there's, there's some truth in that. That's uh, for nonprofits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> many years later, uh, Gordon Yaswin writing about his experience of a 60s commune said something that I think kind of is kind of similar. Uh, there their place fell apart in less than a year. It is said that happy people do not volunteer to go to war. Neither, I say, do they join communities. The roots of this unhappiness may lie in either themselves or their world. We at Sun Hill Community did not know how to determine one from the other, so we hardly tried. We accepted virtually all who came. But I think that we at Sun Hill tended to assume that each other's various inadequacies to live in the mass society were due to the faults of that society and not to those of the individuals in question. Of course, we assumed that such inadequacies or hang-ups would straighten themselves out within the healthy context of our utopia. This was naive. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, um, just a word about communities and so-called cults. A fair number of people today believe that our society is swarming with dangerous cults, uh, put in quotes, okay, groups that are terribly destructive to their members and a real danger to society at large. For better or worse, intentional communities are very often drawn into this controversy. They do have features that many consider cultic. But the problem with that analysis, I think, is that so does just about every religious body and social group that there is. What are the characteristics of a cult that you read about? They often have strong leaders. They work hard to attract new members. They try to get members to follow certain lifestyle rules. They try to get members to stay committed to the group's principles and put a lot of time into the group. And they want your money. Um, you know any religion that doesn't have all of those things? Uh, they all do. They have to, to make it work. 
So I think we'd just be better off getting rid of that term entirely and evaluating all groups on their merits and taking a look at them rather than just categorizing them. As far as I'm concerned, different is not pathological. I don't think communal living has anything fundamentally wrong with it. I think it's good. It's a positive thing for society. Uh, and I just like to, to see things analyzed seriously. Not to say there aren't bad groups and bad people out there. There sure are. But don't just create a category and condemn everyone. It can hurt a lot of innocent people when you do. I think double standards are unfair. Small offbeat groups should have the same rights and privileges as anyone else. They're breaking the law, arrest them. Otherwise, why don't they have the same freedom everyone else has? Or change the law. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when that happens. So anyway, uh, I end as I begin. The world's had communities for thousands of years. I don't think they're gonna go away. I think changes have survived, changes have come into the form. And I do think that intentional communities today have a lot to teach our larger society. In our world of individualism today, uh, uh, communities can show us a more humane way to live. I think they're utopian in the best sense of the word. They're microcosms of the good society. I really do believe they have a lot to teach us, and I hope we can learn from them. Uh, two of the most astute observers of intentional communities in the 19th century, William, William Hines, who wrote a major book still much read today uh, called The uh, Communities of the United States, uh, and Charles Nordoff, I've referred to earlier, both had glowing things to say about the groups they studied. And I have, on the other hand, out taken uh, some copies of their analyses, both of them printed in, in Hines's book. Uh, and my hope is that I mean, you see, this is very positive stuff, and I just hope today's communities do as well, merit that evaluation too. And uh, I love the Lavra. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, all. <laughs>